Hello everyone, this is Beyond Pesto 101, Applying Testing Principles to PowerShell. My name is Glenn Sarti and I am a Senior Consultant at Telstra Purple. Now today, unfortunately, I won't be able to take questions during this talk, but I will be providing a whole pile of resources at the very end of this talk with some links to my speaker deck. So let's start with a story which I hope will feel rather familiar. And this is my Pesto love story. When I first started with PowerShell, I had no idea of testing, except, you know, does it work on my machine? And to be honest, that's all we had. You know, things broke and I wasn't happy and debugging was painful. And after writing PowerShell for a while, and I heard of this testing tool called Pesta. I tried a few things with it, but I didn't really see the benefit. And then one day, I needed to write a PowerShell script to install some software on a Team City agent. And I wanted to make sure that it was installed correctly, so I thought, that sounds like testing, I can use Pesta. So I wrote the tests and they kept failing. And it turns out there was a bug in my script and the tests found it. So testing began to make a little more sense to me. And the more I added tests and the more errors they caught, you know, I began to think that I understood testing. But something happened though. I was making changes, but I had had to keep changing tests all the time so they would pass. And this didn't seem right. It was getting harder and harder to keep the test green with the more tests that I added. But testing was supposed to be awesome. So were the tests with our writing, were they good tests? And what even makes a test good? How do I measure how effective my tests are? So off searching I went and discovered this whole thing called software testing. Now there's a lot of stuff to learn and to make matters worse, some of it was contradictory. And pretty soon, this was me just smashing at the keyboard, trying to figure out what on earth is going on. But gradually over time, I learned the basics of testing. I applied them. I actually spoke with testers, you know, the horror. And now I'm back on track to once more being in love with tests. Now, I'm sure you've had similar experiences with this when you're learning something new. And some of you may even recognize this graph. So as a bonus, Here's a snippet of psychology as well as PowerShell and testing. So even though my current job title is a senior consultant, I've spent nearly 20 years in IT pro or ops person in the Windows desktop space. I mean, I never completed a computer science degree and the lessons about testing came hard and probably took a lot longer than what they should. And it wasn't honest, no, sorry, and to be honest, it wasn't until I started as a Ruby developer at Puppet, I really started to understand and see value in good testing. Members on my team are also c -sharp developers, so I could draw in the experiences of multiple mature languages and apply them to PowerShell. And because I just didn't know, I crested Mount Stupid and descended headfirst into the valley of, desp valley of despair. So my task today is to help you learn some things about testing principles, to get you out of that valley, which you will fall into, and back up to the slope of enlightenment. So let's start the ascent and answer an important question first. Who here tests their PowerShell projects? Now, for those that have said no, you're wrong. Everyone has their projects tested. It's just a matter of who. The people that use your code are the testers. All projects are tested. And for those of you that said yes, why do you actually do test? This is an important question to answer as it's going to guide you when you need to make compromises. It affects how you write tests and ultimately how you write PowerShell. So here's a definition that I like a lot. To reduce the risk that a user will experience an unexpected behavior. And there are three important points here. Reduce the risk. You will never be able to achieve zero bugs, but you can reduce the risk or probability that they will occur. Secondly, the user. Ultimately, your PowerShell projects or scripts will be used by a user. They are the people that you should be concerned about the most because testing is a user-centric concern. And lastly, unexpected behavior. You know, bugs, issues, errors, faults. They're all a behavior which a user does not expect, but it does raise some interesting questions. If we, the developers, think something is a bug, but the user expects the behavior, is that a bug? If a bug doesn't cause the user to notice it, is that actually a bug? And by running a test suite prior to releasing code, 
we can gain confidence in our code so we can get it out to use faster. So one of the disciplines of high quality code is having good tests. High quality code is easy to debug, maintain and add features to. It's also cheaper and easier to fix a bug before it gets released to a user. It ensures that what is created is actually does what it's supposed to do. Therefore, testing forms part of the documentation or a contract for the project. So we know why we're testing now, but what kind of tests can you do? Well, there's a lot of different types of testing. I mean, the PESTA book talks about a few, which is unit testing and integration testing. But there's also smoke, user acceptance testing, localization, globalization, interoper interoperability, and on and on the list goes. One quick Google search and I came across a web page listing 105 different types of tests. And you could fill a book about each type. There's a lot to learn here. So obviously I don't have time to go through all 105, but I'm going to go through four types of tests and how you can apply them in PowerShell and PESTA. So the first one are unit tests. Now if you have written PESTA tests before, this is probably where you would have been starting. So one of the better ways to explain testing is to use the testing pyramid. So this is an image I adapted from Martin Fowler, and we have unit tests down the bottom. So the hare and the tortoise pictures on the left show the speed, and the dollar signs on the right show the cost. So unit tests are fast to run, so we get very quick feedback. They're cheap to run because they require almost no setup, so no VMs, and anyone can run them. And they should also be only testing about a single concern or a single thing, thus the name unit. In PowerShell, generally the smallest unit is a function. So when unit testing, what we're usually doing is making sure that the function does what it's supposed to do. And as we get higher up the pyramid, we see integration tests, which are testing how units interact or integrate with each other. And then finally at the very top, in the very small writing, are full stack tests, also known as acceptance tests. So in this case, we could be setting up virtual machines or we could be doing manual testing. It's slow and expensive to do. And notice how the size of each group is smaller. So ideally you should have lots of unit tests, some integration tests, and very few full stack tests. Why is that? Well, think of it as a quality budget. You've only got a finite amount to invest, and unit tests are cheap, so you can have a lot of them. So let's have a quick look at some real life unit tests. So here's a snippet of code from Poshbot, which is a chatbot written in PowerShell. So in order to test the get poshbot function, we have a single input parameter called ID. We have a single output, which is a PS custom object. And we have two external dependencies, a script scoped variable and a function. And these will need to be mocked when we do our tests. And here on the right side is the unit test for that function. Note that we are mocking the script variable and the function called to get job. And then we call get poshbot with an ID one of one. And then make sure that response is expected. So from a visual point of view, again, we want to test get poshbot. We supply it with inputs. We mock any external dependencies so they don't have any strange or unexpected effects. And then we get the outputs and then match them with what's expected. So this has been referred to as arrange act assert. We arrange the mocks and the inputs for the context that we will test in. We act by calling the function, and then we assert that the result is what we expect. And if you look at the test script, you can plainly see arrange, act, and assert in play. So that's unit testing. So number two, integration tests. So integration tests sit in the middle of the testing pyramid and what we're testing here is how individual units, or in our case, probably PowerShell functions, interact with each other. Now, they're normally slower and more expensive to do these kind of tests. One typical use of unit integration tests is to actually do something on the computer. For example, you know, set a registry key, write to a file. And these tests have side effects that need to be cleaned up, which means these tests are more complex. But if there are so many downsized integration testing, you know, why have them at all? Surely unit tests alone will be able to cover this. And the answer is, it's because unit tests can't catch everything. 
Note that both sets of these doors are operating exactly as they should be when you view them in isolation. They are passing unit tests. But it's not until we put them together that they generate an unexpected behavior. And this is why integration tests are useful. So here's some integration tests from the networking DSC module. Note how we're using the start DSC configuration function down here. This is not a unit test of get, set, or test. This is actually calling DSC, which then calls those functions, how they all integrate together. This is much more complicated and takes more time. Now, I mentioned they were slower and more expensive, so I grabbed some test results for the networking DSC module, and you can see that we've got almost 1,400 unit tests and only 140 integration tests. And yet, on average, they took four times longer to run for each test. And this is what I mean how they take longer and they're more expensive to do. So integration tests can be useful for finding subtle errors that unit tests won't see, but they come at a cost. So next, unit tests again. This was probably my hardest lesson and the one that caused me the most unhappiness. There are different flavors of unit tests. Consider this simple function that returns the display name of a Windows service and the simple test for that underneath. Fairly simple, code at the top, test at the bottom. So the function at the top is going to use a getWMI object call to grab the Windows service and then output the display name. The test down the bottom mocks the response from the getWMI object and that way we can assert that the response is what we expect. But what if what if you weren't given the whole function and just the header? How would you test that? Well, you wouldn't know how it gets a service, so you can't really do any mocks. But you can still write a test for a real Windows service that's common on most, if not all, operating systems. So knowing how a function works changes how you test things. So you may hear this referred to as white versus black box testing. So the more formal definition is, Black box testing is a software testing method in which the internal structure, design, and implementation of the item being tested is not known to the tester. White box testing is a software testing method in which the internal structure, design, and implementation of the item being tested is known to the tester. You may still hear this referred to as behavioral versus implementation tests. So in a black box scenario, you're testing how it behaves, which is what it does. Whereas in a white box scenario, you're testing how the behavior is implemented, which is how it does it. And in most larger software shops, you know, white box implementation tests are usually written by the developers. And black box behavioral tests are usually implemented by, say, the quality assurance or you know, BAs. Now, most of us won't have the luxury of having a QA team to do our PowerShell. So we need to be able to understand both and the pros and cons of each style. And lastly, black box tests can be harder to write, as we usually know how it's implemented. Actually forgetting something we already know is actually quite a difficult thing to do. So it forces us to write our code differently. It will force us to use parameters more so you can pass in dependencies instead of determining things as an implementation detail. White box tests are easy to write, but they're more fragile. So what do I mean by fragile? So remember my example earlier, <clears throat> where we're getting the service name and the test for it. Well, I shouldn't really be using get WMI object. I should be using get service, for example. So if I change my function to use get service, as soon as I do that, my test fails. Now, even though my code probably works and it probably behaves the same, the tests fail. And this is what caused me the unhappiness. Whenever I made a change and the test failed, was it my change that was wrong or was it the test that was wrong? It doubled the number of things that can go wrong when writing PowerShell. Also, even if I rewrote the test with the correct mock, it still doesn't prove that the function is behaving correctly. In my gut, I know it's true, but I can't prove it with my tests. So how can I move from white to black box testing? Well, your functions may need to change. Firstly, all input into the function should come through input parameters. So this removes the need for external calls and mocks. 
but it's not always possible or practical to do. So what you can do is you can wrap those external dependencies with a private function. Because you control the private function, it becomes safer and easier to mock. So while Blackbox, prefer, while Blackbox prefers you don't have internal knowledge, mocking private functions is considered a bit of an okay exception to the rule. And these aren't new concepts. So the learning PowerShell scripting in a month of lunches book, month of lunches, <laughs> month of lunches book talks about tools versus controllers. Notice the tools accept all input from their parameters. Tool style functions are ripe for black box testing. Which now leads to the question, you know, which is better? And the answer is both. Both types of tests are useful and neither are intrinsically bad, but they both have trade-offs. So remember way back at the beginning, I started with the question, why do you test? Well, in my case, I said that testing is a user-centric activity. And for the most part, users only care what it does, not how it does it. So I prefer to use black box style testing whenever I can. But I still have white box tests. Because sometimes I have to test how something is done. And this leads to the million dollar question of should I test private functions? Now, private functions are an implementation detail that users don't interact with. So they should already be tested as part of the public functions. So the answer is no, but if it supports why you're testing, then yes, you should test private functions. If there is some other behavioral test, then yes, you should test private functions. If it reduces the number of tests, but you still get the same confidence, then yes, you should test private functions. So that's black box testing. So that leaves us with number four, which are unit tests. So again, you know the drill. Characterization tests, which are a form of unit tests. So a characterization test documents the actual behavior of the system as opposed to what we specify the behavior should be. Now this sounds very familiar to black box unit testing, and in truth they are, but they have a different purpose. For example, in the unit test we previously looked at, those are specification tests. Given these specific inputs, I expect the outputs to be blah. So they specify what the behavior should be. Characterization tests don't care what the output should be, they document what the output currently is. So here's a very simplified example. We have a function called step by one, which should take an input of value and then output the number by one. So if you give it one, it should come out with number two. However, the actual code increments it by two. So we can see a unit test there saying it should be two. So you give it one, it should be two. But our characterization test goes if we give it one, it should be three, because that is what it currently does, not what it should do. So why would we even use them then? Well, characterization tests are a fantastic tool when you need to make changes to a legacy PowerShell, PowerShell project, but it's too complex or hard. Like, you know, how many of us have projects we avoid like the plague because they're hard to change? You know, these tests are a lifesaver. So the term characterization test was first coined in the book uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code by Michael Feathers. It's an old book, back in 2004, but it stood the test of time really well. Now, while the examples used in the book are around Java or C Sharp or C++, they can be equally applied to PowerShell. He also defines legacy code as code without tests. And how many of us have code without tests? Yeah, the, I also have lots of code without tests. So I discovered this book while I was working on an old Ruby project when I was a puppet. But the lessons inside are just as applicable to PowerShell developers too. So here we have a, a single function that is horrible, you know, a monster method with bad code. So before we start making any changes to it, we write a series of characterization tests which document the existing behavior. So as we make changes to the legacy code, we can ensure that the behavior is preserved. So even as we write good, clean, nice refactored code with proper tests. And at the end, we can move some of those characterization tests as proper unit tests. And the end, 
We end up with good, clean, nice code with good test coverage. But more importantly, we are confident we didn't change any behavior because we kept running those characterization tests. And that's just one technique from the book. <clears throat> Here are some other chapter headers, and I'm sure some of them will jump out to you. So I highly recommend reading that book, uh, Working Effectively with Legacy Code. So those were the four types of tests, uh, unit, white box tests, integration tests, black box testing, and characterization tests. So if you remember back to my PESTA story, climbing up that slope of enlightenment, the first half of that ascent was learning about tests themselves and how they can be used. The second half is just as important. It's not enough just to have good tests. They need to be tended to and cared for. They are just as important as the code they test and deserve as much love. Particularly as you add more and more code, we should add more and more tests. It's good practice to review your test suite periodically as it's easy for the suite to grow in size but not actually offer any benefits. So what kind of things can you do? First, you can try and reduce how long the test suite takes to run. So having a large test suite may be required for larger PowerShell projects. For example, when I last looked at the SQL Server DSC repo, it had about 3,000 tests and took about 50 minutes to run. That's a long time. So we should look at ways to decrease the total testing time. Now there are obvious things like, obvious things like you know, get a bigger computer, get a faster hard drive, but there are other things too. One thing we could do is run PESTA tests in parallel instead of serially like PESTA does. So I added to PESTA 4 a function called invoke parallel PESTA. Now there have been many discussions about this kind of thing. If you go trawling through Stack Overflow, you'll see many ways this is done. I took inspiration from when I was at Puppet and we have a tool there called uh, RSpec but there's also a parallel RSpec, so I took that implementation and put it into PowerShell. So how does this work? So in regular PESTA testing, if you had five test files, PESTA would process them sequentially, one at a time, and then output the result. In parallel PESTA, you take those same five test files, and each file will be run as a separate PESTA job in an isolated run space. This was using um, the module from Warren Frame. And then the output of the five jobs will be then processed and all kind of smooshed together to produce the same out output as regular PESTA, but in a much smaller time. And there were some interesting results. So I'm not going to bore you with the demos of PESTA running because the results are far more important. So I used the DSC networking module project as a baseline, had about 985 unit tests, and was taking just about 80 seconds to complete. So that's that straight red line at the very top of the graph there. I then ran parallel, parallel PESTA, and I restricted the number of jobs that could run. So that's the one, two, three, four, five, six down the bottom. So I started with one job at a time. That's basically emulating the same behavior as regular PESTA. It took 90 seconds. Quite a big increase in time, which was bad, but not unexpected. Creating and managing run spaces actually takes time. I then ran two jobs at a time, and then three, and then four, and so on. And the performance bottomed out at about 42 seconds. So I basically halved how long it took to run the tests, which was excellent. What was interesting though, is that the performance got worse after four jobs. So I attribute this to my test computer was hitting 100% CPU during the test and it just couldn't do any more processing. So when you throw more and more at it, it took longer and longer to do because it was just juggling too much. Because more is not always better. But there are also some other downsides. Uh, yeah. Because the tests were being running in parallel, the results were also written to the console in parallel, so it looked like a ripe mess. Uh, so in this example, we have times on separate lines, the describing context test text is all smushed together. It looks, it looks horrible. So parallel PESTA is good if you just depend on the PESTA summary at the end and outputting the, you know, the end unit XML files. And this is usually what happens for automated testing suites like in AppFire or GitHub Actions, as opposed to you running it on your local computer. Um, at the moment, I haven't got the code coverage working. It's possible to do, it's just a little difficult to do, and I didn't do it for this, this talk. You can also get some weird and subtle race conditions where the tests unexpectedly depend on state from other tests, or it doesn't expect two tests to be run at the same time. Uh, let's say, for example, you had one test to create a registry key and one test to delete a registry key. Um, if they both happen at the same time and they're both trying to access the same registry key, you're going to get some strange effects like 
the create one will run, but then the delete job will delete it, and then by the time the create tries to test, it's gone, so it'll fail. So sometimes they'll work, sometimes they'll fail, sometimes they'll both fail. It's just really strange results. So to help with this, um, use the test drive facility in Pesta, uh, but you can also use like get random or GUIDs for test names. So that way you don't use you know HKLM software test key. It'll be HKLM software plus you know ten digit ten digit random number for each test. That way they're not going to clobber each other. You can also inadvertently depend on state being set up by tests that were run prior. So instead, you should really be explicit about setting up your test setup and then tearing it down. This way you can be sure that your tests are valid. And not everything can be run in parallel. I mean, take example for DSC. The LCM can only process one request at a time. So this means you can only run the DSC module integration tests. Well, you can't do them in parallel. They can only be done in serial. However, the unit tests, they can still be run in parallel. And it's also dependent on what's actually running the test. So here's the same tests on different hardware. I've got an older quad-core CPU and a newer dual-core. So the dual-core is a lot faster for regular PESTA because it's a newer processor. But once we started throwing more parallel jobs at it, the quad-core was a much faster, even though it was an older CPU. And the dual-core really hated having too many threads throwing at it. And lastly, this was based on PESTA 4. Uh, the new PESTA 5 may actually solve all these problems uh, with parallel running. So that's getting tests running as fast as we can. So the next big, next best thing is to not run tests at all. So every test you create needs to be maintained. It takes effort and time. And ideally, you want to have the minimum number of tests to satisfy, satisfy the risk of users getting unexpected behavior. So how do we do that? Well, we use data. PESTA outputs structured XML data files. And from PowerShell, we can easily read these XML, put that into a database so we can query it. So let's see this in action. And we'll pick on the DSC X networking module. <clears throat> so here's the output from an app via build on a pull request. So the build and test process outputs these end unit XML files from PESTA, and then AppVay compiles them and display them in its UI. So that's the test section that you see highlighted there. And in this build had 1,075 tests. We can then query the AppVay REST API using PowerShell, get the last 10 builds for each of, get the build version for all those builds, which then gives us the job number, which you can then use to get the test results for each job. So then we end up with a JSON file per job per build, which we can then parse easily in PowerShell into a simple data model. So we have a build. It has zero or more successful tests, zero or more skip tests, and zero or more failed tests. So now we actually have the data. We can start asking questions of it. So this is the build history of the DSC networking module as an example. We can see over time the number of tests are being added. And while it may be a bit hard to see the failures, unfortunately, because there's lots of successes there. But note that really large jump. So I guess that we really thought tests were important back then. It'd be nice to see code coverage stats on there too. There's always improvement from the, on my scripts. So what about the failure profile? So now we can look more specifically at failures. 40 builds only had a single failure. 25 builds had two failures and so on, up to the very end where we had 62 failures for three builds. Okay, so what about tests we can get rid of? Are there any long running integration tests? So here we have one test that takes 40 seconds, another around 25 and 15 seconds, and then we've got a dozen around the 10 second mark. Perhaps they could possibly be better served as unit tests instead of integration tests. Okay, what about are there any tests that have never failed? I mean, are they providing any value? You know, if they're not providing value, delete them. So that 40 second test that has never failed has been run 208 times. Is that test actually needed? Is there sufficient unit test coverage for it? Can that test even fail at all? And there's some more advanced questions we can now ask the data. You know, are there tests that always fail together? If so, we can get rid of one of them. Are there tests which are just failing too often? They're too flaky. Well, if they're not giving any value, then we can get rid of them. 
And lastly, are there any files that tend to fail the test more often? Perhaps we could increase the testing there and then remove testing elsewhere. So there's a wealth of information in these test outputs. So now we have our test suite as fast and as small as we can get it. We can reorder the testing to give us faster feedback. So one of the objectives of testing is to give us, the developers, fast feedback and confidence in the changes that we're making. And we call this failing fast. A technique that we used at Puppet is our test tiering, where we rank tests as how important or useful the tests are on a simple medium, high, and low scale. So in Pesto, we can identify tests by using the tag parameter on describe blocks. So in this example, we're tagging the smoke tests as high. But how do we know which tier to put the tests in? Well, looking back at the DSC networking module, notice that the two most common failures aren't even code related. They're to do with markdown files, documentation. Perhaps those common documentation tests should be marked as high because they have a high failure rate. So now when we run Pesto, we can specify which tier of test to execute. So for example, the very top, only execute high tests. In the middle, we have high or medium, and the last, run all tests except for the low value ones. Uh, just watch out though, um, if you don't tag a test, it will always be run. So make sure if you're gonna do test tiering, you always tag your tests. So once the tests are ranked, we can then change the execution of the tests. So instead of running them in somewhat random fashion, um, we run the high tests first, then the medium, and then the low. So that means the highest value and most common tests get run first. If they fail, there's no point running the medium or low tests. So we can get faster feedback with no loss in test coverage. So here's an example of how you can do it in AppVaya to run the test in order of high, medium, low. So you can see point one there, we have our test matrix of high, medium, low. In point two, we change our test script to say which tag we actually want, actually want to run. And then point three there, we tell AppVaya that inside the matrix, if one cell fails, we cancel the entire build. So that's what fast finish means. And lastly, some general maintenance. Some general George S. Patton style maintenance to be exact. So he's attributed with saying, say what you mean and mean what you say. And this applies to your test suite too. The way that tests are described should not be cryptic. They should be clear and concise. If your test description says it should do X, X then your test should do X. For example here, this is a test from the DSC networking module. And if anyone has only done any group policy administration, you will be cringing right now. Double and triple negatives make things really hard to understand. So instead, say what you mean. So instead of being should not contain files without a new line at the end, that should really become should contain files with a new line at the end. Much easier to understand, much easier to read. And here's another example from the Pester book. So notice the description there says it attempts to change the, uh, sorry, attempts to test that the WMM SVC server startup is type of automatic. Thing is though, um, it never actually tests for that. It just tests that the computer name is equal to something. So instead, you should mean what you say and actually test that the service is WMS SVC and that the startup type is actually automatic. So wrapping up, we looked at the four types of tests, white box unit tests, integration tests, black box unit, black box unit tests, and characterization tests. And then we looked at how we continue to tend to our test suite to keep it in good condition by reducing duration, removing tests, reordering tests, and general maintenance. And while today I was mainly concentrating on PowerShell modules, these principles can still be applied to DSC pipelines as well. So where do we go now? Um, try things, read, ask questions, find a project and write tests for it. Now, usually even bad tests are better than no tests at all because you can learn from them. And hopefully I've given you some idea of how big the world of software testing really is. Now, not everything will be applicable to you right now, and that's okay. And hopefully I've given you some pointers of where to start and where to look when you next come and actually have a look at testing suites.
So software testing is not a gift or a talent. It's a skill, which means it can be taught, it can be learned. It also means you need to practice it. The more tests you write, the faster you can iterate on your skills and the better you will get. And the great thing about learning testing principles is these are not just PowerShell skills. They can be used on almost any language, C Sharp, Ruby, Rust, Go, Java, TypeScript, anything. And with that, thank you. Um, if you want to contact me, uh, feel free to hit me up on Twitter. Uh, my blog and my speaker deck site is where you can find the slides and all the resource, resources that I've used. Um, and with that, thank you very much.